So for over two years, India has been buying a ton of Russian oil. It's a big reason why Russian revenues are staying high. It's also a big reason why we aren't in a bigger inflation crisis. India and China alone accounts for 90% of Russia's exports. They are the biggest buyers because Russian crude is just so cheap. So why is India suddenly refusing Russian oil? And this is a very important event that we must investigate further. In a shocking report, Indian refiners have halted all Russian oil supplies from a sanctioned tanker giant, and the company in question is Sovkomflot. That is Russia's biggest shipping company which transports crude from Moscow to buyers around the world. Refiners are afraid of touching Russian oil on board because of US sanctions. Big refiners, including the Indian Oil Corporation, have stopped taking cargoes if they are on board the company. And let's recall the G7 sanctions on Russian crude. The aim of the price cap is to prevent countries from buying oil above $60. And for almost a year now, Russia has been selling crude well above $60, and this is pissing the West off. Since July 2023, the price of euros have been rising well above the price cap. It even hit $80 a barrel at one point. And because Russia has a growing shadow fleet, this allows them to freely export their volumes to the world above the price cap. Russia still sells at a discount, but not as deep as the $60 mark. For example, if euros were at $80 a barrel, Russia could sell their cargo at $70. The buyer still gets a nice discount, $10 discount, while Moscow earns more revenue, well above the price cap of $60. And this is why the discounts for Russian oil have been contracting. From January 2023 to October, the discount went from minus $40 a barrel to just minus $12. A big part of that is from the shadow fleet. More than 70% of vessels transporting Russian oil don't belong to the G7. The discounts are widening because the West is tightening the screws lately. They are losing their minds and imposing secondary sanctions on countries buying Russian oil above $60. And this is freaking India out. India buys their oil on a delivered basis. And this means they rely on shipping companies to transport the oil to their own terminals. They only pay when the oil reaches the country and discharges it into the tanks. India is a growing exporter of oil products to the world. They exported 6.3 million barrels in July last year, and this has grown to 8.5 million barrels in December. And a ton of this oil is being sold to Europe and the US at higher prices. So you can see the quandary India is trapped in. If they take crude from Russian tankers, their refiners might get hit with sanctions. The G7 could block Indian oil exports to their markets, and they might stop buying from India as well. Western companies can't do business with the Indian refiners anymore. And that's the dilemma India faces. Because of this, some Russian cargo tankers can't discharge their cargo. They're caught floating at sea waiting for a buyer. So Comflot tankers accounts for 15% of crude shipments to India. It's not a majority, but it's still a sizable amount. It caused the shipments from the company to fall. It averaged around 10 shipments a month, but it could crash it down to two shipments in March. It's not good for India either. They can't buy cheap Russian crude to process, which will hurt their refining margins. But will this collapse Russia's economy? Is it all over for their crude exports? Well, not really. Remember, this ban accounts for only 15% of shipments to India. There are other shadow vessels India can use to bring cheap oil to the country, and by definition, it will be harder to track and sanction those tankers. Despite India buying less, Russian revenues haven't taken a hit at all. The value of the exports is still near pre-war levels. The initial price cap in December 2022 created a big shock. It caused revenues to collapse by almost 40%. But since then, it has normalized and earnings are back up. There will always be outlets for Russian oil. It's impossible to sanction the entire shadow fleet. The tankers will simply change their flag of convenience. It will be an endless game of whack-a-mole. The West will crack down on one flag and then the vessel switches to another and there are around 600 such vessels around. The G7 is playing a very risky game. If Russian volumes fall enough, we could be back in an inflation crisis. But let's talk about the biggest winner of this, and without a doubt, it's going to be China. If India continues to drop their imports of Russian oil, it's going to flow towards China, and Beijing will be buying them at a big discount. It's simple supply and demand. The Chinese will soak up this additional volume rather easily at better prices. This month alone, China will set a new record for Russian oil imports. March will be a breakthrough for Chinese demand. Whatever India isn't buying, China is coming in to fill the gap. 
India, for example, has been moving away from Russian Soko oil because of payment issues and sanctions, India backed away. But China tripled their Soko imports to 380,000 barrels a day. If we look at China's total imports, we can see increasing support for Russian oil. Because of India's retreat, China's advancing their flows rather aggressively. Before the war, China imported only a million barrels a day. That has now doubled to 2 million barrels. And it's across the board. Oil imports from the Eastern Pipeline in Ping are heading up. Soko oil from ships in yellow has exploded higher as well. China's buying a ton of cheap energy from Putin. It's a big reason why manufacturing in China is just so competitive. It's why companies in Europe like Germany are relocating there. Inflation is hardly 1% compared to the West, which is easily 2, 3 or even 4 times higher. China's big advantage comes from their geography, and they are located next to Russia. The ESPO pipeline in eastern Russia provides China with a ton of oil. China gets 35 million tons a year of crude from this pipeline alone. That's around a million barrels a day of oil flowing directly into China. You don't need any ships to transport this, so there's no risk of sanctions. And by 2025, Beijing can import 1.6 million barrels a day through the ESPO. This is cheap crude that feeds directly into China's refinery network in the north. This allows them to process the oil into diesel and gasoline at a discount. This increases their margins when selling oil products to the world, especially Europe. It's simply the geographical advantage China has, its proximity to Russia and gives it a tremendous advantage, especially when India is buying less from Moscow. And this also affects their refining margins. To make up the volumes from Russia, India has been buying more oil from the US, and that's more expensive than imports from the Middle East as well. Since January, India has been buying more volumes from the US. It's about to hit 7 million barrels in April. So India's loss is benefiting the US, and we can expect this to keep heading up. India has to keep refining to protect their market share, but profits are going to hit down because Soko oil is cheaper. There's a 4 to $6 price difference, which is quite a lot. Now, I don't think India will decouple completely from cheap Russian oil, but if this continues, they will lose a lot of money to Chinese refiners. But let's talk about the Moscow concert attack because it's serious and it's very tragic. It shocked the whole of Russia and there's a ton of suspicious events linked to this. So two days back, a horrible attack took place at a concert in Crocker City Hall. There was gunfire, there was explosions leading to many casualties. According to Russian media, the death toll has hit 133 people and possibly more. Some figures put it at over 140 today. ISIL or ISIS admitted to it. But there are a ton of weird things that happen as well. Now the first of course is the travel warning from the US State Department. As you can see, it's a direct security alert to all travellers to Moscow to avoid large gatherings including concerts. It's important we look at the wordings here. Extremists have imminent plans to target them and it is a warning for US citizens to stay away from the crowd. And this was on March the 8th, two weeks before the attack. It really raises a ton of questions. Did the State Department know the attack was about to happen? Did they liaise with the Russians to prevent this? And why did they specifically single out a concert as the venue? America had intelligence that ISIS did the attack. They confirmed it. Did someone in the CIA or in the intelligence network know about this attack beforehand? And all these are serious questions and they need answers. Putin has of course vowed revenge and he has linked things to Ukraine. In a speech, Putin drew the link. The four attackers were heading towards Ukraine. A window was prepared for them and they had to hope to cross the border. And if this is true, then Ukraine is implicated and the war is going to get even more bloody. We have no idea for certain but it looks like Putin is heading towards that direction. So I hope to give you more updates but things are just in a big state of flux. I want to stick to the facts because this whole situation is tragic and messy at the same time. There are just too many loose ends here. What's crazy is how Zelensky is pouring fuel on the fire. Instead of laying low, he's giving Russia a punch to the gut at this point in time. He's going to make an angry Putin even more furious. He calls it absolutely predictable that Putin is trying to shift the blame elsewhere. Zelensky called Putin a low life and scheming to link the attacks to Ukraine. Just on this alone, the fighting in Ukraine is probably going to get even more brutal. Russia has arrested all four suspects and if there's any link to Ukraine, they are going to get the truth. Now, I don't want to speculate until we get the facts, but it's looking really messy here. John Kirby says there's no link to Ukraine in the attack and Russia is, of course, trying to press the Americans for evidence to share information to prove their claims. From the Russian foreign ministry, on what basis 
Does officials in Washington draw any conclusions in the midst of a tragedy about someone's innocence? Russia's fuming, and if the Americans can't substantiate this, it's going to cause a further uproar. And on the other hand, this is just going to unite Russia even more. Putin has declared March 24th, which is today, a day of nationwide mourning, and is perhaps the lowest point for Russia this year, and it's just the calm before the storm. But let's shift gears to our final story. It's even more crazy than India rejecting Russian oil. The West is running out of money to fight Russia, and they are moving to confiscate the frozen reserves. However, the US is putting an interesting spin on things by proposing issuing a new type of debt. Biden wants to issue freedom bonds to fight Putin, to fight the Russians. America wants the G7 to sell $50 billion in bonds for Ukraine, and this will be debt backed by Russia's frozen assets. Now let's cover this from the perspective of the US. We know it's a crazy move. In general, using the assets is a bad move. You open Pandora's box again and make the dollarization even worse. But we must understand why the US wants to issue bonds. It's a very different strategy from simply using the profits generated every single year from Euroclear. The EU wants to transfer $3 billion in profits every year to Ukraine, but the US wants to modify the plan. They want Europe to issue $50 billion in freedom bonds backed by the Russian assets. And this is a sign that the West is just getting desperate. The US has given up the game, and the first is admitting that the $3 billion is nothing. Russia is outproducing the West in ammunition. The defense budget is going to hit 30%, which means a ton of weapons are going to be produced. Russia's Defense Minister Shoigu shared the numbers in December. Moscow now produces almost 18 times more ammunition, 17 times as many drones and nearly 6 times as many tanks versus pre-war levels. And that is a war machine that's popping out an incredible amount of weapons. And the Americans know $3 billion a year will do nothing. It won't even make a dent. They need a lot more money to go shopping for weapons. And if we look at the economic side of things, it makes sense for them to grab $50 billion now from investors. Because the bonds are backed by the Russian assets, you can safely default on it if you decide to return the assets. The proposal would pull $280 billion of Russian central bank assets into a special purpose vehicle, the profits of which could be used to fund the freedom bonds. The US is looking for a risk-free way to raise capital to fund the war. And if things get really desperate, they'll confiscate the Russian assets to pay back investors. But if things backfire and they somehow need to return the money to Russia, then investors will get screwed. The freedom bonds idea is a crazy scheme to raise the money. The chance of default is quite high. And whoever buys the bonds is taking a big gamble on their investment. The bonds might never ever pay out. It's such a bad idea that even Germany and France can see through it. They are opposing the idea because it would completely break trust in the Western financial system. The moment you create those freedom bonds, you are obligated to act because you now have external investors. If you screw over Russia, you destabilize the dollar and euros as reserve currency. If you screw over your investors and default is just as bad, you'll face a ton of lawsuits and trust in the Western system will take a big hit. Either way, it is a disastrous plan. So the situation is getting from bad to worse. We have attacks on Russian soil, India is buying less crude from Moscow, and the US wants to issue bonds backed by the frozen assets. It's getting messy on all fronts, but let's conclude with India. Are they going to dump Russian volumes for US or Middle East crude? Now firstly, if India does that, it will destroy the oil market. The energy minister himself said that the world needs India to keep buying Russian oil. If we only buy Middle Eastern oil, the oil price won't be at $75 or $76. It will be at $150. So ignoring Russian crude will ignite a new inflation crisis. And secondly, I don't think Delhi is going to decouple from Russian oil. They're not that crazy. It's unthinkable to break relations with Moscow. Sure, the volumes from the softcom plot floaters will go down, but over 80% of imports will still come from a shadow fleet. Indian refiners are trying to sign term deals with Rosneft, the Russian oil company, and it's all about price and payment protection. But the longer India delays, the big winner will be China. And I don't think India wants to let go of such a big advantage. Volumes over time will normalize. Russian oil will still flow to the world. But let me know what you think. Who are involved in the Moscow attacks and is India really exiting Russian oil? Let me know in the comments below. Stay safe, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe as we navigate through these crazy times.